Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Melinda. Um, on behalf of FOSI committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you here today in FOSI online talk series. I hope you enjoy your lunch and ready to see the presentation from John Warren. Amid this COVID-19 outbreak situation, hope everybody doing well, stay at home and keep physical distancing. I would like to extend my gratitude to our sponsors, uh, Nobel Energy Resources and Geoscience Delta Andalan for funding of this, of this Zoom platform. So with us together, um, already join uh, Mas Ricky, our General uh, Secretary of FOSI, and Pa Herman, our advisor, and then the uh, rest committee is uh, Mas Erlanga here, and Tri Handayani as well, joining us. And the rest will join us soon. We're glad to inform you that we established the FOSI YouTube channel. We uploaded all the videos from the previous talk already. And don't forget to subscribe and like the channel and please enjoy the video. And today's talk will be uploaded as well. Uh, the special presentation will tell you about geological characterization of reservoir quality in tertiary age carbonate reservoir across Southeast Asia. And the registered participants, as always, beyond our expectation, is about 200. So maybe because uh, today is Saturday, uh, they will be coming a bit late. So I believe most of you know him very well, met him, or maybe already have his useful publication on carbonates. John will share the materials later on for our documentation as well. If anyone did need the material, please wait until the end of this session. I will send you a bit later. So well. Before I hand over to John, as usual, please allow me to give you some rules in order to make this meeting running smoothly. I would like to get your attention for a moment. First, I recommend all participants to mute the audio and switch off your video during explanation from John to maintain good connection. Second, the presentation may be recorded for screening within the FOSI platform. Third, a Q&A box can be found in the icons panel, usually at the bottom of your screen. Enter your name for the committee to collect after the presentation. It will be answered live by John later on, and you might turn on your audio and video to deliver your question. Last but not least, uh, later we can see how many questions coming in, and we can see how it goes. If many questions arise, so we can separate into uh, two sessions, and we can have a break for a moment. So well, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy your talk and please welcome John Warren. Please, John. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be with you this afternoon. What I'm talking about today is a three-part presentation. We will look at the relationship. Oops, sorry, I've got to get my screen back here. There we go. We'll look at the relationship between three major styles of reservoir developed across Southeast Asia. We will spend about equal time in each of these three sections. We'll look at the Madura Strait focused Neogene Blobagerinid sands, which Maradona Mansour, Rick and myself interpret as internalites with little or minor diagenetic alterations shown in their isotopic signature. The second third of the talk will deal with the major oligomycin age tertiary reef road algal four amyl bedded platforms developed across many areas of Southeast Asia. And there we see varying degrees of diagenetic alteration, cementation and leaching in these features. And then lastly, we'll look at a buried hill association where the matrix for the reservoir is basically tight and we're developing porosity and permeability in reactivated fracture systems with much of the reactivation being in tertiary age associated with the what we call the Paleocene or the Himalayan event associated with the migration of India colliding with Asia and the fracture systems that, that sets up. So those are the three associations that we'll deal with the units that we're looking at are in effect of varying ages from latest Miocene in the Globigerina internalites through oligomyosine associations in the 
road algal for animal associations through to typically hard rock permian cemented or even granite diuretic systems in the fractured basement plays but they all have a common characteristic in that they are or their economic porosity and permeability is associated with tertiary age processes so let's start off with the internalite reservoirs these are the very well-known or at least in indonesia well-known globigerinid sands of the mundu formation in the madura straits offshore indonesia so here's the stratigraphy of this association where we are focusing in on the mundu formation here and age wise it's now known to be latest miocene it's historically been classified as pliocene earliest pliocene but strontium 87 86 work that we've done in combination with uh, what was santos indonesia has shown that these globigerinid sands are more likely to be latest miocene rather than early pliocene and they are associated with a range of tectonic events and shallowing associated with those tectonic events with pre-existing structural highs on which these sands were deposited. So here's the general uh, distribution of the, the play fairway where we have outcropping globigerinid limestones on Java Island and then to the south of Madura Island offshore we have a range of fields the BD, the Oyong, the Malio, the MDA fields which are characterized by these globigerinid sands and as I said they tend to form a top structural highs in this thrust shallowed association. In terms of the development history of the succession you can see the first Globigerinid sand fields were first developed in the early 80s and we then go through this is cumulative discovery volume in millions of barrels of oil equivalent on the vertical axis. We go from Terang, MD, Sirison, Oyong, Malia, MH and then a whole composite of fields in the teens in the early 2010-2013 time. So these are not insubstantial hydrocarbon reservoirs. It measured in hundreds of millions of barrels of recoverable. The two areas we're going to focus on are located south of Madura Island, Area A and Area B. Today, Area A is in slightly shallower water than Area B, and this was probably also true in the latest Miocene when these sands were actively accumulating. And we'll look at area A as being characterized by well one and well two in the Oyong field. And then we will look at well three, which is located in area B in what is today and was in the latest Miocene, somewhat deeper water. So here is a seismic line from Arafin and Ferguson published in 2017 of the Oyong structure with the positions of well one and well two shown there. You can see it's a, a topographic high, a structurally induced topographic high. And the reservoir itself in the Mundu formation is a reworked globigerinid ooze where reworking has converted it to a grain dominated packstone or a globigerinid grainstone. So we have taken quite a muddy sediment a globigerinid mudstone or a globigerinid waxstone and converted it to a grain dominant sediment as a grain dominated, dominated packstone or a grainstone. So here's the contrast you can see quite clearly in the reservoir quality in this sequence. You can see that in its depositional state, which is the slide on the right, in its depositional state, this is quite a muddy sediment. There's a bit of porosity in there, but it's quite a muddy sediment. When it's been reworked by bottom currents, much of that mud is removed and we form a very nice, highly porous reservoir, grain dominated packstone or a globigerinid 
grain stone. And you can see that quite clearly contrasting also. And you can see that even in the single thin sections, in the lower part of this thin section, where we have porosity of the range of around 50% and half a Darcy permeability, you can see that highly winnowed clean nature of the lower part of that sand. And then in the upper portion, you can see how where it has not been winnowed, all of the inter-shell positions are dominated by mud. So you can quite clearly see here that once we remove the mud, as we see in the lower two thirds of this thin section photomicrograph, it makes an excellent reservoir. Something else to notice here is that you can see the, the, the various globigerinid shells or tests there. And individually, in an individual test, you can see these puncti. These are little holes where the amoeba that made this test actually extended its feeding tubules out through it. And what's interesting is this is late Miocene sediment, but these tubules remain open. So this is an unusual carbonate sediment in that the intrafossil and the extrafossil are connected across the fossil shell. So porosity here where the mud has been winnowed is highly effective in terms of its reservoir properties. Okay, let's have a look at some core through this succession. So here we've got well one and well two, and you can see a number of interesting features here. The first one is that the sands here are cross bedded. Now the fact that they are cross bedded immediately tells you that these are not turbidite deposits. You do not form bottom oscillation currents in a turbidite deposit. So these sands, their cross bedding is telling us that these are not turbidites. There's some other process active here, which is cleaning up these globigerinid oozes and converting them to grain dominant pack stones and grain stones. In some zones, we can see cemented bands. These are possibly hard grounds, and here's one such cemented band here. We can see that some of the sands have quite a bit of glauconite, and the green color we're seeing in this sample here is coming from glauconite. And we can also see there are commonplace trace fossils. We'll see that more clearly in the next slide. So here we can see a range of trace fossils present in these fairly clean sands. One of the most interesting is the fact that in these sands we see Ophiomorpha. And these Ophiomorpha fossils are quite commonplace in the better reservoir intervals in these sands. Now historically Ophiomorpha has been interpreted as being related to sort of shoreline, near shore sedimentation and zones of high wave energy in that zone. And historically, when the earlier work was done on these globigerinid sands, the presence of Ophiomorpha was used to say that these sands were deposited well up on the carbonate platform, well up on the shelf in zones subject, or well, that were sitting at or above wave base. So water depths of 30 meters or less was the early interpretation of these sands. But since then, people have looked at where Ophiomorpha actually occurs in modern sands. And we find that Ophiomorpha certainly does occur in swash zones, which is its classic interpretation position. But it also occurs in storm beds. And it also occurs in any sediment where sediment is being moved on the bottom and sediments being rapidly eroded and then redeposited. And so it does not directly indicate shallow water position. Ophiomorpha is indicative also of just wave oscillation. So if we have a process where we can make the bottom sediment move in fairly deep water, we can generate a wave oscillation process in that system. So here we've got an example now of well one and well two. Well one sits on the crest of the structure. It's a little better reservoir than well two. And you can see that in the porosity and permeability values here. But you can quite clearly see that well one has the better, or the cleaner, I should say, reservoir properties, less mud. Well two has a little bit more mud in the system. So still respectable permeabilities and still quite high porosities, but not as high in 
as they are in well one. So well one and well two still are both quite good reservoir quality sands. But well two on the right has more mud in the system and so it has lower permeabilities. But once again, you can see that in these samples, let's look at this one here, you can quite clearly see that the intrafossil and the extra fossil porosity is joined up across the puncti, these holes in the foram shells. Now this is really minimal diagenesis we're seeing in these thin sections. There's been very little cementation in these samples. Basically what we're seeing is what was deposited at the end of the Miocene and not much has happened since. Now if we go to well three, which is a, a lesser quality um, reservoir system, probably deposited in somewhat deeper water, but I think still on the upper slope, but less subjected to winnowing, we can see there's a much higher intensity of mud in the system. There's a much broader range of trace fossils where we have things like Diplocriterion, Haliminothensis, Neurites, also some Ophiomorpha, some Paleophycus, some Thalicinoides and Zophycus in that system. And we also see quite well developed bands of clay remaining in the sediment. So well three is much less winnowed, much less reworked. And you can see quite clearly that the permeabilities in well three are much lower. We're looking at permeabilities of less than 10 millidarcies, but the porosities are still quite high. The porosities are up around 45 to 50% that porosity is coming from the intrafossil, the within the globigerinid fossil material. And we can quite clearly see that in the photomicrographs here. This is the, the chord interval in well three, where you can quite clearly see once again, there's quite good porosity, but the interparticle positions in these thin sections is dominated by mud. The mud has not been winnowed from the system. So we're looking at still quite high porosities, 40 to 50%, but permeabilities down around 10 millidarcies or less. And there are also some preserved cemented bands in here. Here is a dolomite cemented band, which we'll call unit three in this position here. And you can see that the effect of this dolomitic micrite is to cement up completely the interparticle positions and it's also cementing up some of the intraparticle shell positions as well. And we've now got porosity of less than 15% and permeability of 0 0.02 millidarcies. So overall, well three, less winnowed, much muddier. By the way, I, I threw in on this slide, I put in the, uh, the strontium 87, 86 measurements here. This is, the, this is from uh, the MacArthur Lonus curve. And you can quite clearly see that that well three sample range sitting in here on the strontium 87, 86 gives us a date of around latest Miocene, not Pliocene for this material in well three. So if we now compare wells one and two with well three, we can see the difference in porosity and permeability. The yellow and the green come from well one and well two. And you can see that the range of porosities is between 30 and 50%, but their permeabilities are up to a Darcy. And that's because all of the interparticle mud or most of that interparticle mud has been winnowed from the system. Whereas if we look at well three, we still got porosities in the same range, maybe a little bit lower, but still 30 to 50%, but permeabilities are much lower, less than 10 millidarcies generally, because we are looking at a system there where the mud has not been winnowed from between the globigerinid shells or tests. Now, I think that's due to bottom winnowing. We've had bottom currents actively winnowing the sediment. But the other interesting thing we see is we look at the isotopes on these globigerinid sediments, both in wells one, two, and three, as we see on the left-hand plot here. So here we have oxygen isotopes on the horizontal axis, carbon isotopes on the vertical axis. And there you can see the range, you can see they overlap. The wells one, two, and three pretty much overlap in the range zero to minus three. The cemented intervals in well three, which are well cemented, this is the dolomite cemented interval up here, probably indicating some sort of methanogenic cement. And here is a probably a bacterial sulfate reduction cement 
in a cemented unit um, sitting below the, at the base of the core in unit three in world three. But the actual, the majority of the tests sit in this range in through here. And it's what's interesting, if you go to say a globigerinid sediment forming today, in plankton forming today in the modern Arabian Sea, for example, this is from a paper by Peter Zedow, and these are the globigerinid isotope determinations from modern Arabian Sea globigerinas, two species, globigerina boloides and globigerina ruga. And you can see quite clearly that these modern globigerinids, their temperature range overlaps very well the range of these late Miocene globigerinids. And so, you know, there's minimal diagenesis happening here. And so what we're seeing in terms of reservoir quality isn't directly related to diagenesis. It's indicated by the levels of mud that remain in that sediment at the time it was deposited. And we interpret that, Don, Ricky and myself, as the result of the passage of what we call internalite waves. So let's look at what we mean by an internalite wave in the ocean. So here's a, a general definition. Now, a general definition of an eternal wave is any wave passing through the interior of the world's ocean. And that's the key point. These are waves in the interior, not at the surface, but in the interior of the world's oceans, typically set up at zones of temperature and density contrasts, what we call picnoclines, within the oceanic column. And quite often there are waves that are set up where we have the picnocline corresponding the, to the top of some sort of inter-island sill, or it may be at the top of a seamount, where these waves set up. And where these waves then move and impact onto a upper slope position, typically, they can rework sediment at depths between 100 to 300 meters. So let's look at a demonstration of that. I'll come back to this diagram in a minute, but I just want to show you, this is, um, a video um, put out by the uh, Portland State University showing us what internal waves are. So this is a general map of internal waves. Now remember they set up between zones of restriction. So look at all these internal wave generation areas between across Southeast Asia where we've got zones of restriction so that as gravity waves or tidal waves move around the earth, they pass through these zones of restriction. So here's a simple uh, desktop experiment to show you what internal waves are. It's just a simple tank. And in that wave tank, there are two layers. There is an upper layer, which is composed of mineral oil. So it's less dense and floats on top of a blue dyed water layer, which is the lower layer. And that's representing the, the more dense, typically colder water mass in the world's oceans. Now within that wave tank, there are three main parts that they use to demonstrate the effect of internal waves. There's a, a lever or a rocker arm to set up the, the, the equivalent of a tide. There's a, a submerged obstacle in indicating the position of the seamount or the inter-island sill. And then at the edge of the tank, there's some sort of inclined bed or shoreline. So moving that rocker arm backwards and forwards, you can see the effect of that in the wave tank and notice where it passes over that sill waves are being set up at that level of the sill across that seamount or shoreline sill and yet at the same time there's not a lot of wave action on the surface and these waves can be thousands of feet deep more typically 600 feet or less, and they can be amplitude wise, the, the actual wave crests can be of the order of 100 meters, you know, skyscraper type waves. Their passage can take days rather than minutes that we see in surface waves. And here we've got the experiment without the restriction. And you can see that without the restriction, we don't see a lot of movement of either the upper surface or the picnocline, the, the density contrast surface, only very weak internal waves are being generated in that scenario. But once you put that sill in place, you can quite clearly see the waves setting up at that density interface at the picnocline. Now we've got a problem here with this wave tank in that it's reflecting off the edges of the wave tank, but 
in a natural experiment, these waves pass thousands of kilometers across the oceans once they're generated at this zone of sill. And you can see them being set up here. This is a, a slow motion effect. You can see the effect of that sill setting up these oscillating internal waves, moving in both directions away from that shallow sill or a seamount. But once again, notice that there's very little movement at the, the surface. All of the movement and all the wave action is taking place at that position where the density interfaces occurs below the surface at that mineral oil, blue water dyed interface. Okay, and from there we can now look at once we generate these internal waves, what is happening on the actual shoreline position out here, what's happening out here in the shoreline. So here comes an internal wave moving from left to right and there's a bit of um, debris on that sloping surface and as that internal wave front hits it's moving that sediment it's sorting that sediment there is current activity there is bottom current activity taking place on what is the equivalent of the upper slope water depths of 100 to 200 to 300 meters and we'll do we'll repeat that again to see the same thing again it's generating sediment sorting. This is the mechanism that's removing mud from globigerinid oozes where we have internal waves, they're sometimes called solitons, internal waves impacting that upper slope surface. So what that's doing is that we have a, a like a, a three-stage cycle. Time one, we see the breaking wave moving across the upper slope. I put a depth of 150 meters in there. Um, you know, that, that will vary. That depth corresponds to the level of the picnocline in the system. And you can see the, the swash run up. And you can see the backwash flow. So we're seeing oscillating waves. We're seeing ripple and crossbeds forming in that scenario. As I said, most wave picnoclines are at depths of between around the world between 100 and 500 meters but they can be as deep as thousands of meters or as shallow as 50 meters now a lot of these deposits in the past were called contorites but we now think that internal waves is a much more documented activity for forming a lot of clean sands in the upper slope and even in the lower slope if there's appropriate density contrast in those slope and rise positions. So what's the relevance to Madura Straits? Well, let's have a look now at what's happening in the Lombok Straits between the islands of Bali and Lombok. And here in the Straits, there is an inter-island sill in that position. Here you can see it in the bathymetry. And by the way, I should point out that as we generate, and you can see the internal waves being generated here. These are traces on the surface of internal waves. This is one that happened an event on April the 23rd, 2.30 in the afternoon on April the 23rd, 1996. This set of waves is moving northward and this set of internal waves is moving southward. Now there's a very important difference in terms of what happens when these waves impact because the waves moving south are just moving out into progressively deeper water in the Indian Ocean and a 4,000 meters water depth here. But as they move north from Lombok Strait, they are impacting on the shallow waters of the Kangian and the Sempanyang Island zones. This is the, basically the southern side of the uh, Sundaland platform. But you can see that we've got wave action possible here. Now, this is an echogram of these passages documented by um, Sosanto in 2005. So this is progressive echogram soundings of that passage of the waves. And you can see that the wave height here is of the order of 150, 100, 150 meters between crest and trough. These are 150 meters between crest and trough on these waves. So these are echogram traces, passages. This is time on the horizontal axis, 1228, 1234 and so on of the passage of these waves. And this is not a one-off event. 
Karang et al. published a paper in 2012 where they showed that in 2006, they documented this through satellite imagery 13 times, 2007, 41 times, 2008, 48, and so on. So these events happen a number of times, more frequently than monthly, every year. <coughs> so this is Karang's model of the Lombok seal. Here is the, the surface of the ocean. And here is the 320 meter peak decline depth that was generating those waves. Here is the Lombok sill, <coughs> excuse me, and it corresponds between with the less dense, warmer upper waters and the cooler lower waters of the Indian Ocean. We are generating this zone of internal waves documented today between the islands of Bali and Lombok. Around the world, this is just documenting where internal waves are forming at different stratification points in the world's oceans. You can see that most are relatively shallow, you know, more than 40, 40% uh, are in water depths of less than 100 metres and there's far fewer at greater water depths. So when we look at this association, it's important to recognise that we've got this ability to generate on the upper slope, lower shelf, wave reworking actions due to the passage of internal waves at the level of picnoclines in a number of places in the world's oceans. And so this is the modern, this is a, a gravity map. Um, this is the general trend of Java going out to Bali, Lombok. And here is the, the island sill between the two volcanic centers of Bali and Lombok. And that's the generation that we just documented moving waves north and south. But you can see that also on the gravity map, there were older, now buried positions, now continental positions on these older volcanic cores in the island of Java. And so there's the Madura Ridge, there's the Java coastline running down through here, and here we have the possibility of either this or this being the, the generative stages that created the internal light deposits back in the latest Miocene. So what features do these reservoirs have in common? Well, they're cross-bedded, clean globigerinid sands, combinations of grainstone and grain dominated packstones. Because they are sediments of rapid erosion and dumping of sediment, Ophiomorpha is quite common in these sediments. And as are glauconite pellets rather than glauconite muds, because the muds along with the other muds are winnowed out, we just leave behind glauconite pellets. And these deposits are internalite deposits formed by oscillating bottom reworking currents moving backwards and forwards and winnowing the mudstones. And there's little evidence in the isotopes, as we saw in the comparison with modern and ancient globigerinid isotope signatures, there's little evidence for subsequent post-depositional diagenesis in these sediments. So this is the model that we've developed for these deposits. You have some type of volcanic island running through here, and you see a sill which is generating the passage of internal waves. Those waves moving south are not going to impact with any shoal shelf slope area of interest to the Indonesian play, but they will generate in this zone here as they impact on the slope and they'll rework what were globigerinid oozes of the southern edge of the Sundaland rising Madura Ridge platform They'll generate these globigerinid sands. So this is where well one and two were positioned. Well three is probably positioned a little bit further out in the late Miocene in slightly deeper water. So it didn't see the effect of wave reworking in that zone. And there's one other point to note here that, that explains why we don't see a lot of subsequent uh, early meteoric diagenesis in these systems. And that is when these sands were being deposited, they were being deposited at depths of around 200 meters. Now, sea level in glacier eustatic times, which is certainly what the late Miocene was. I mean, we've had glacier eustatic fluctuations since the middle Miocene, and we're looking at very latest Miocene here. We were fluctuating sea level by the order of 100 to 150 meters. But when that's happening, that's happening in this zone here. And so this is where we're seeing with a lowering of sea level, say a hundred meter fall, 
we are seeing a lowering of sea level. That's where our meteoric diagenesis is taking place. But where our globigerinid sands are accumulating, we are below the zone of early eogenetic meteoric diagenesis. So they're not as susceptible as any sort of meteoric flushing as any platform sediments up here. And that explains why we then cover the system in marine mud, we don't see a lot of evidence of meteoric di or any diagenesis or very little diagenesis in the reservoir. Probably hydrocarbons were in place fairly early in these sediments as well, but that's not as clearly documented by the isotopes. We're inferring that rather than concluding that. So this is the reservoir play. We're looking at a reworked upper slope system where we had a sill to the south and we had internal light waves impacting on the upper slope. So that's the one style of reservoir in Southeast Asia. Now let's move on and look at the oligomyosine carbonate platforms. And examples of this would be Yardana, Malampaya, uh, Satiga, Arun in Indonesia. These are all examples where we've had oligomyosine carbonate bedded platform systems. So this is just giving you some of the, uh, the reserves or the, the producible hydrocarbons in here. Yardana, something like 5.3 TCF of gas. Um, Malampaya, something held something like, it's now um, inactive, held something like 3 TCF of gas and around 50 million barrels of oil. Um, Arun, something like 16.2 TCF. And Segatiga, yet to go into production because of the high levels of CO2, but it probably holds somewhere around 6.3 TCF. So these are examples of these bedded oligomyosine carbonate platforms. Now, historically, people think of these bedded carbonate platforms as reefs associated with a coralgal reef association. So this is, well, we'd all like to go for vacation, but it's also the perception of what these Miocene platforms look like, some sort of nice tropical lagoonal shoal water deposit. But the reality is actually quite different. They're not coralgal platforms like the Great Barrier Reef. They're not dominated by photozoan coral associations. The Miocene platforms in Southeast Asia tend to be well bedded. They tend to be heterozoan. They tend to be what we call oligophotic, which I'll explain in a minute. And they tend to be in humid tectonically active regions with generally collapsed, not reef rimmed margins. So they are not the classic reef lagoon atoll model that we tend to perceive for carbonate platforms. So let's go back into a little bit of sedimentology 101 or maybe it's 301. Um, where we look at two types of associations, we'll look at the photozoan association when this is the, the classic coralgal association where we've got combinations of coral and coralline algae um, where they are up in the very shallowest waters, water depths of less than 10 meters is where they're most effective in growing and they are very much light dependent systems. Um, they hold within their cells, for example, the corals, a lot of photos, what we call photosymbionts, which allow them to metabolize carbonate very, very quickly. These are high growth systems growing in clear, well-lit water, the photozoan associations. And that's our classic coralgal reefal association. So the photozoan association actually consists of a number of subsets. The coralgal one, which is the one we tend to emphasize, which are these reef forming corals formed in association with calcareous green algae, things like halameda and penicillus. And they might have some forams and some mollusks, but they're dominated by this hermatypic association. If things get too salty or too hot or too nutrient rich, they become chloralgal associations where the, the, the algal turf, the green algae take over. In the past, the photozoan association was very in combinations in the Permian. It was what we called the fusion algal association where we had a combination of calcareous algae, crinoids and fusilinids, or the, the rudistid association in the Cretaceous where we had Rudists with cell harbored photosymbionts living in their cells, forming shelf edges in very shallow water. 
And so this is the typical association that we tend to think of in these type of associations, you know, the, the classic where I want to go for holiday, where I want to go diving on the reef. But then we've got what we call the heterozoan association. Now heterozoan carbonates are dominated by skeletal remains of biotas that are feeders. And they include things like the, the road algal fasces, the foramol, which is the foram mollusk fasces, the bryodermal fasces, the bryozoan mollusk fasces, the mollusk chloroalgal association fasces. These can be, not always, but they can be light independent communities. And certainly compared to the photozoan choroalgal association, there's much less dependency on light for this heterozoan association. And they don't just form in lower light areas, they also form in areas where we have elevated trophic resources. Things like nutrients can be elevated in the system. Uh, waters can be quite turbid, a lot of suspended matter in the water. Or they can also flourish in zones below the zone of light penetration or the, photo, or the photic zone. And as we'll see in a minute, they can also, appropriate, in, in appropriate warm tropical waters, they can also form an association, especially with the road algal association, which is in part light dependent, but it's also able to cope much better with high levels of nutrients and high levels of uh, temperature in the system. So here's a typical rhodolith system. This is a top volcanics in the Canary Islands and all that white sediment are rhodoliths on the left hand side there. So, Rhodoliths are what we call an oligophotic association. Oligophotic means um, lower light levels. We sometimes talk about the, the photic zone as being divided into three parts. The upper intense light penetrative zone or the sunlit zone. The lower oligophotic or dusk zone where it's almost like sunset or sunrise, not quite as bright. And then the aphotic zone where there's no light penetration. So road algal associations can thrive in conditions of lower light. And typically they're dominated by the crustose coralline algae or rhodoliths. They're also associated with bryozoan beds and benthic foram beds, barnacles, bivalves, and so on. Um, they are very common in areas where we have seasonally turbid and nutrient stressed warm waters or tropical settings. They also form in cooler waters below 18 degrees. And historically, People working in the Northern Hemisphere put this assemblage into a cooler water indication, but it's not. It's quite common in tropical waters, as I'll show you in some waters of offshore Brazil in a moment. There's also, as part of this oligophotic association, in a little bit deeper water than the rhodalgal association, is the foram mollusk association, dominated by a combination of benthic forams and molluscan debris. And that's favoured by somewhat deeper and typically a little bit dirtier, turbid, warm lagoonal waters, or it can also be a cool water setting. So here's an example on the screen on the right of a road algal bed in offshore Brazil. And this is an area where these things are now well documented. Here's some more areas of warm temperate waters offshore Brazil. On the left, you've got what is a rhodolith pavement where there's very little extra coralline algal growth and on the right, you've got a rhodolith pavement, but now it's got a green algal association. So you can see there's abundant halometa flakes, there's penicillus, this is sometimes called the, uh, the, the corn flakes, the Kellogg's corn flakes of the carbonate realm. It's shaped like little breakfast cereal flakes, these halometa fronds. And we've also got Neptune's shaving brush, the penicillus association. This is contributing a lot of sediment into this rhodolith pavement. And then in somewhat deeper water, this is typical of the southern coast offshore, the upper slope of Australia for example, and also the temperate waters of offshore New Zealand, we get these bryozoan associations at the boundary with the base of the photic passing into the aphotic zone. So these are communities that do quite well in reduced light conditions. So this is just a giving a general classification of light penetration in the system. And here you can see the amount of light penetrating. So here we've got sea level, intertidal and supertidal above. This is the zone of light saturation going from 100% um, carbonate sediment production into progressively lower light levels. 
And in terms of the light penetration, we call this upper zone the euphotic or the sunlit zone. The oligophotic, less light penetration, we sometimes call this the dusk zone, reduced light zone. And then below that, the dark zone, the euphotic zone where there's little or no light penetration. Now, this is a scale of 100 meters. We're saying that this, this depth is 100 meters. But obviously the depth of which the aphotic to oligophotic to euphotic zone actually occur will vary according to how clear the water is. In very clear open ocean waters, like in the open Pacific Ocean, the depth of light penetration is down to 200 meters. In a lot of lagoons in Southeast Asia and elsewhere, the depth of light penetration, especially during times of monsoon and seasonal runoff from river systems, very well-fed river systems, the depth of light penetration can be measured in tens of meters. So it varies according to the clarity of the water. How, how deep does light penetrate into the ocean waters? In that uppermost zone, we see corals and the green algae flourishing in the what we sometimes call the euphotic biota. In the dusk zone, in a little bit uh, less light penetrative waters, we see combinations of the coralline algae and the larger benthic forams. And as we get down into the darker, deeper waters, we see the bryozoans, the mollusks and the crinoids taking over in that system. So the depth of light penetration depends on water clarity and that in turn can be both detrital and nutrient level controlled in the water column. So when we look at the Southeast Asian associations, we can put this in terms of not just light penetration, but also nutrient levels, which will affect the planktonic densities in the lagoon. And we can see that in tropical and subtropical waters in oligophotic clear open ocean waters without a lot of nutrients in the system, the photozoan system dominates. When we get higher nutrient levels, we start to see the heterozoan photozoan transition. So we start to see the road algal and the four amyl associations in there. And as we get into cooler waters, we get into the heterozoan associations. So think of that in terms of the context of Southeast Asia and the carbonate regions in Southeast Asia, where we are seeing responses of light penetration and varying temperature levels. We see varying levels of nutrient in the lagoons. We see seasonal monsoonal runoff and strong currents promoting plankton and turbidity. We see freshwater flooding of lagoons. And so that type of scenario, those platforms really don't favor the photozoan association. They tend to favor the oligophotic associations in the majority of the platform. So if we look at the Miocene, this is um, a study by Brandano and others from the Mediterranean Miocene, but you can stick the same model worldwide. In the shallowest, clearest, light penetrative waters, we see the coralgal association. In a little bit deeper water, we see the road algal association and somewhat deeper water. Again, we see the foramyl association in these Miocene carbonate buildups. And then, the last thing we have to consider for carbonate sedimentology 301 is what happens in terms of the growth of a platform. So in any carbonate platform, we will see an initial startup phase, the early transgressive systems track phase, where we'll see vertical accretion patterns dominating. And this happens when we have a rise in sea level and seawater first moves in as relatively deep water over a previous carbonate high and we initiate carbonate production. As that system then accretes, it vertically accretes, it builds up to a system near sea level. So we pass from what we call the startup phase to the catch up phase in the transgressive system track, where now the carbonate production is basically tracking the rising sea level. And what we see forming in the platform interior will depend on turbidity, temperature, clarity, and so on. Once that system reaches sea level, it has the potential to generate more sediment than can accumulate in the shallowest water portions. And so we start to prograde the system because our carbonate production is now exceeding the rate of creation of accommodation space in the system. 
And generally on the platform top, we'll see cyclic responses within this overall keep up high standard systems track. There'll be higher fourth and fifth order fluctuations of sea level. And we'll see cyclicity in the platform interior associated with that. And then if we have a fall in sea level, so that sea level now falls off the top of that platform, we'll see reduced areas of our carbonate platform growing in the shown there in dark blue around the margins, and we'll see subaerial exposure and karstic exposure across the crest of that platform. And then the last thing to happen is that we can drown that platform. So that now we, we get water so deep that the carbonate rate of production is not sufficient to have any sort of vertical accretion. And then ultimately it will be covered with some sort of siliciclastic sequence atop a drowned profile. And I'll come back to this, this drowning unconformity that's forming on top of this type of platform, separating the siliciclastics from the carbonates a little bit later. But that very simple discussion of the three stages of start up, catch up and keep up or transgressive systems tracked, high stand systems tracked, and low stand systems tracked, is telling us that the diagenetic responses we're going to see in these carbonate platforms is going to be a variable response to possible subaerial exposure, drowning, different types of drowning unconformities or subaerial unconformities, and then also subsequent burial diagenesis. So let's put that in the context of the Southeast Asian oligomyosine, notice right I'm putting reef in inverted commas here, I don't think they're truly coralgal reefs. These are road algal, four amyl bedded carbonate bioherms. They are not coralgal reefs. So in general, across Southeast Asia, the buildups that we see that are producing these large volumes of gas tend to be oligophotic platforms, dominated by bioclastic species, rich in low light level biota dominated by a combination of rhodoliths, coralline algae, and perforate, larger benthic forams. And in the clearer waters around the platform margin, sometimes we get varying levels of coralgal reef forming as well. Now, historically, the rhodolith and the foramol benthic foram associations were interpreted as cooler water assemblages, but we now know that they are warm water assemblages, because as we see in Brazil, we see a lot of green alga, halometa and penicillus. If that's in the system, along with your rhodoliths, that's not a cold water system. That is a warm water oligophotic association. And most of the carbonates that we see in the tertiary of Southeast Asia in the bedded carbonate platforms are these oligophotic associations. So the platforms that we form in this type of scenario have a minimal area of shallow water at sea level deposits, limited to the platform edges, the framework reefs and the occasional patchwork reef within the platform interior. But most of what we see are very well bedded seismically, alternating between road algal and four amol and sometimes bryamol associations in the systems. The bryozoan tend to be the deeper water of the three if we see them. And then lastly, when we talk about conceptually what we see in Miocene or Oligomycene carbonates, we have to think about diagenetic overprints. And as we know, all subsurface carbonate reservoirs preserve varying intensities of diagenesis, some minimal diagenesis, like we saw in the globigerinid internal light deposits. Others, as we'll see in a moment, have a range of diagenetic episodes preserved in their textures and their isotope signatures. Now, all carbonates follow this very simple burial uplift cycle. We have three general classifications of diagenetic carbonate. We have the early diagenetic carbonate associated with eogenesis. The eogenetic realm is where diagenesis is driven by the hydrology that are present in the depositional system. The mesogenetic realm, also known as the burial realm, is where we see diagenetic textures indicative of burial alteration. And that can be both cementation and also leaching. And then lastly, we have the uplift realm or the telogenetic realm where that carbonate system is brought up closer to the surface and we see evidence of 
freshening waters, castification, speleothems, soils, uplift related features in the telo genetic realm. And that's why when we look at most ancient carbonates, we start off with a sediment that looks like this. And we end up with a sediment that typically looks like this. And that's true of all carbonates in the ancient. They will show evidence of not just their depositional environment, but also their diagenetic environment. And so we tend to classify those sediments in the different burial environments, the eogenetic, the mesogenetic, and the teogenetic, telogenetic realm. And we see evidence of these different diagenetic environments variably preserved in most ancient carbonates. Okay, now let's back into Southeast Asia from this general sedimentological discussion and have a look at what's happening in the oligomyosine in Southeast Asia. And just looking at that very simple Google Earth image of Southeast Asia, it's immediately obvious this is a tectonically complex area. It's not a passive margin like we have with a lot of carbonate development around the Australian coast all through here. There's carbonate sediment actively accumulating and down through the Great Barrier Reef province. These are trailing margin carbonates, opposite what is a fairly semi-arid, more humid in the north, but semi-arid terrain to the south in this system. This is an equatorial belt, high rainfall area, a lot of subduction and a quite complicated tertiary tectonic history in the system. Whereas much of the reef systems in Australia is a very simple trailing margin tectonic regime. So let's have a look at that. On the left, focus on the left image. And this video is showing you the development from the Cretaceous through to the present. And you can quite clearly see how tectonically complicated Southeast Asia is compared to the Australian continent to the south, which at this stage is still moving east. Now it's starting to move northeast and in a moment it'll start to move north. Notice that Southeast Asia has maintained its equatorial position. It sits around the equator, whereas Australia migrates into a more equatorial position. And so carbonate sedimentation in Australia takes place later. Now we're focusing in on the sort of the, the uh, oligomyosine period and look at the tectonic complexity that's happening centered around Indonesia, Thailand and the Philippines. There's a lot of very complicated tectonics going on in there as the various plates edges interact. And so what that means is that we get a system where we have basins of various ages and activity related to the tectonic interaction from the Paleocene, Eocene through to the Miocene. And we also have a range of inversion ages as shown by this paper by uh, Hall and Morley published back in 2004. You can see there's, there's quite a complicated tectonic association and that many of these basins have independent tectonic histories. They don't all follow the same pattern. Whereas the, the carbonate platforms on the Indo-Australian plate tend to show a much simpler tectonic passive margin history. So within Southeast Asia, we can divide our carbonate platforms up into two fundamental types. What we call isolated platforms, where the platform is isolated from any major source of siliciclastic input, typically across a subduction belt with a whole range of, of um, thrust duplexes forming below it. And then what we sometimes call a coupled carbonate margin or a coupled platform margin, where the, the carbonate platform is coupled to typically some sort of continental volcanic influenced hinterland and a source of terrigenous sediment. So this type of platform is located well away from a source of terrigenous sediment dominance. This type of platform has terrigenous sediment input on its backside throughout much of its history. And it also, obviously because it's coupled, you have the potential for more meteoric as well as flooding from river systems into the backside of this type of system. So this system is typically distal to a terrigenous source 
this system typically is proximal to some sort of fluvial sediment. And here, when we see sea level fluctuations, we are going to see siliciclastic sediment move out across the platform in times of sea level low, and then retreat back up during times of sea level high. This system, when we fluctuate sea level, is more prone to just see simple um, subaerial unconformities in times of sea level low, and then passing back into another episode and ultimately both of these systems will drown. I say let's for a moment step back and do a little bit of climatology. Let's have a look at what the, the Miocene climate was doing in Southeast Asia. So this is a plot on the upper axis of uh, carbon 13 on the vertical axis here. And here it's as equivalent in the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This is from a paper from Matu et al. 2020. And here is the, the temperature curve for open ocean uh, water on the lower in blue axis. And we can see a number of interesting events. We can see the Paleocene, Eocene collision of the Indian plate began the uplift of the Tibetan plateau. And that also drove a major Oligocene warming event in here. So the collision of Asia starts to really kick in, as we saw in that uh, video a few slides ago, starts to really kick in in the late Oligocene. We start to see major climatic changes and we change from a latitude paramoral climatic event into a much more localized monsoonal um, climatic event. And so we start to see the jet stream forming with the associated monsoonal stream forming back at the Paleocene Eocene boundary. And the Miocene begins here at about 23 million years, and this is the climatic optimum for these bedded carbonate platforms. Now, this diagram I took straight out of Matthew, he calls it coral reef, but we should really call this bedded carbonate platform expansion. And you can see the various episodes of, of the Tibetan plateau uplift running through here. And also in parallel, we can see the, the, uh, the Antarctic ice sheet expansion. We can also see the degradation of the, the climatic optimum with the onset of the Southeast Asian monsoon at about 13 million years ago. And well, here's our Globigerina ooze sitting up in here. So what's characterizing all these systems, this is just a photo of the monsoon taking, looking north from Darwin is we see a lot of high energy, we see a lot of localized storms, we see a lot of freshwater input, we see a nutrient input coming off the mainland throughout Southeast Asia, and we see basically turbid water. So Southeast Asian carbonate factories throughout their history have been subject to monsoonal climates with the ability to freshen and flood lagoons. Active tectonics, island arc volcanism, typically high levels of nutrients and clastics in the waters. All of those factors will favor, favor oligophotic low light heterozoan over photozoan carbonates. And it also ultimately favors bedded carbonate platforms passing up into drowned profiles with ongoing edge collapse. So, Elevated nutrients reduce water clarity, promotes large scale isolated and land attached oligophotic platforms throughout the Miocene. The interior of these platforms are dominated by a carbonate factory that formed in oligophotic rather than photozoan encouraging positions. And so we tend to see road algal four amol associations, oligophotic fauna and flora rather than the photozoan, very shallow water, clear water, flora and fauna. We do see bound stones in the clear waters around the edges of these platforms, but tendency is much more to see lagoonal bedded systems, which are laterally continuous. And so when we look at these systems, we tend to see a, a depositional geometry, which is much more bedded than we typically see in a barrier reef system. We tend to see these um, shallower bedded biohermal ridges dominated by mixed photozoan and heterozoan biotas and then somewhat deeper still bedded bioclastic horizons uh, 
with a heterozoan biota dominant. We still use the same terminology, but we don't see the dominance of the choralgal association. Okay, so with all that under our belt, let's have a look at a few examples. So let's look first of all at Yardna, um, offshore Myanmar. So here's, here's Myanmar here, here's Rangoon, there's the Irrawaddy Delta, and here is this oligomyosine Yardna gas field offshore out through here in the system. Now, that field contains something like 150 billion cubic meters of reservoir gas, you know, Miocene, carbonate, upper and lower Burman limestone host. Life expectancy of the field about 25 years. And at the end of 2009, it was output was averaging something like 780 million cubic feet per day. So here is a typical seismic line through the yard and the gas field. And there's something that's very obvious here when we first look at the seismic here, and that is the nature of the internal bedding here. These are almost railway track like internal bed forms. This is unusual in a barrier reef platform to see this level of bedding. That's because what we're seeing here is alternations between less dense and more dense layers, seismically less dense and more dense seismic layers, related to alternations of the oligophotic rhodolith and foramol fasces in the system. So we've got the lower Berman limestone in here, uh, a clastic wedge called the sine clastics in here, and then an upper Berman limestone in here. And here is the gas water contact in the field running about through here. Notice that the lower Berman is in two separate platforms. There is a northern and a southern platform separated by this clastic wedge, and then the upper Berman, which is the main reservoir, is laterally quite continuous. Notice also there's not a lot of evidence of boundstone margins. A lot of this edge looks like it's collapsed. And so here's the seismic. This is from a paper from Tillet et al. 2019. And you can see quite clearly here is the lower uh, Berman limestone with the yard in the north platform and the yard in the south platform, separated by the sine clastic field channel. And there is the more laterally continuous upper Berman limestone running through here. The top of the system is a unconformity and there's 15 million years from the end of the upper Berman limestone deposition till the clastics come in over the top. So it was not the clastics that drowned this platform. There's 15 million years at that surface. Carbonate deposition stopped before the clastic seal was laid down over the top. And that's a common characteristic. Most of these oligomycine um, reservoir systems across Southeast Asia, typically the clastics are separated from the underlying carbonate reservoir by a five to 10 or more million years. So this is the model that's been developed. Here's the, the Yardner North and the Yardner South platforms. And next we have the, the sine clastic input interpreted as a sea level low when we had clastics building out all the way across the platform and infilling that, that channel system between the north and the south platforms. And then a complete platform instigated over the top of the system. So here's a typical wireline log. I won't give you the well, but um, it's a typical wireline log running through the reservoir in Yardner. And you can quite clearly see this is gamma on the left. Notice the depth. We're at 1,300, 1,400 meters. Remember the depth in the uh, Globigerinid oozes was about 950 to 1,000 meters. So these are both fairly shallow water, obviously oh, shallow water, fairly shallow depth carbonates in the system. A number of interesting things here. You can see that the, the, the gamma curve is picking up uh, more clastic rich intervals in there. This one probably fed the sine clastics 
you can quite clearly see the good tracking between the neutron density overlay. There's not much dolomite in the system. There's a little bit, but not a lot of dolomite. The, the neutron density overlay is tracking very well. And here you can quite clearly see the gas effect in the separation of the neutron and the density log. And you also quite clearly see it in the separation between the MSFL and the LLD logs running through here. And here you can see porosity from about 1360 meters up to the top of the reservoir. These are core plug measured values. And you can see porosity, <coughs> excuse me, porosity overall is increasing slightly from values down here around averaging around 20, 25% to values at the top of the reservoir up above the, uh, the gas water contact porosities are up around 40%. Likewise, permeabilities improve toward the top of the reservoir, both in terms of horizontal permeability and in terms of vertical permeabilities in that system. So let's look at the actual reservoir rock now. So this is the actual reservoir rock, and you can see it's not a typical coralgal limestone. It is coralline algal rudstone, as we can see here and we can see benthic foram rudstones and benthic foram floatstones and here we've got more typical coralgal floatstone association so there were certainly some corals in the system but the system is dominated by alternations between rhodolith and foramol associations so the dominant biota in here is oligophotic rather than photozoan. And as we saw in the seismic, there's quite a bit of evidence of collapse around the margins. But not only that, in that system, there's some rather interesting other associations we see. We see well-developed in the reservoir, well-developed moldic and vuggy 4M grainstones. We see the development of dollar microspar in the muddy matrix in places. We see hard grounds preserved within the system, within the reef facies. And there's an ongoing discussion of whether these are subaerial or drowning hard grounds within the Yardner bedded carbonate system. Here we can see a typical, sorry, my uh, pointers run out of battery, so I'm using the arrow now. Here we can see a typical 4M grainstone, much better cemented in the water zone below the gas zone. And in the gas zone, here we can see, here's a starlight, and we can see vuggy porosity that post dates stylitization. So there's certainly evidence of some late stage porosity development as we see in E in this reservoir system. And there's evidence, I won't go into the detail, you can read the paper by Tillett and how there's a couple of papers you can read of mud supported 4M rhodolith and coral rich sediments showing early dissolution associated with that drowning unconformity. And that stable isotope evidence is suggesting a fairly significant level of diagenesis was driven by the time when the platform growth stopped before the clastics came in, when that system was sitting below fairly cold oceanic, deep oceanic water, you know, a kilometer or so deep before the silicoclastics came in over the top. And that probably drove significant levels of leaching in the system. It's not necessarily meteoric leaching, it's probably cowhood circulation leaching in that system. And there's also associated with that cowhood circulation some level of dolomitization over the top and the flanks of the yard and the platform as well. And there's also evidence that the micro porosity in the system occurred during shallow burial. It's not depositional. So here's some evidence of late stage porosity. Here we can see more vuggy porosity in B, where I'm shown by the yellow arrows, where there's a stylolite with vugs developing along that stylolite. We can also see some of the micro porosity being developed below the gas water contact, suggesting that there is a, a phase of microspar porosity associated development more pronounced within the gas zone than it is within the water zone. And these dolomites that are forming, shown in B, tend to be across the top and the flanks of the structure. 
Now, what's interesting is if we look at the isotopes in this system. So here we've got the isotopic data. I plotted it up once again with oxygen isotopes on the horizontal, carbon isotopes on the vertical. And these are bioclastic measurements. Okay, and so these are taking the actual grains, the red algae, the rotoliths, the benthic forams, the corals that have been converted to calcite and so on, plot in this field here. Once again, minimal diagenesis. We're looking at ranges between zero and minus three. Some diagenesis, but not pervasive diagenesis. We've also got the dolomites. And those dolomites have a fractionation of about four. They're plotting out at around three and a half, three to three and a half. That's pretty typical of what happens when you get marine waters circulating through the, the limestone early on in shallow diagenesis with cold waters circulating through the drowned platform, we're forming these dolomite signatures. And then if we have a look at the, the calcites, and this is in the, 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 the blocky calcites in red above and below the water zone, these are more diagenetically evolved. These are a little bit more negative. So these are a little bit hotter, more early mesogenetic type cements rather than eogenetic cements we're seeing here and here. Okay. So that's Yardner. It's got evidence of ongoing diagenesis, and there's certainly some late stage burial enhancement, some leaching, not a lot of cementation, but a lot of leaching in late stage burial enhancement. Now remember I said the depth of the Yardner reservoir is around 1300, 1400 meters burial. Let's have a look at another example of the Berman limestone in a different area of BMR, where we're looking at a system where we are looking at a limestone system which is attached to a volcanoclastic core and as you'll see this is a much poorer quality reservoir it's also a much deeper reservoir it's a much more diagenetically evolved reservoir it's been sampled in a total of nine wells drilled through the system and it fits the same model depositionally as we were talking about with shoal water sand shoals um, for our mole um, versus uh, rotolith associations in the system in shoal water positions, but it's attached to a volcanic center. So here's typical core through a well in the system, and you can see it's a much muddier looking system. It's also got a lot of horsetail stylites. It's a much more stylitized system, and you can see the porosity and permeability is much lower. You know, these, are, these are very low perms in this carbonate system. We don't see the development of the porosity and permeability that we've seen in Yarden. Notice the depth. We're down at depths of 2600, 2700 meters. So this is a much deeper, hotter genetic environment. And there's also evidence of hydrothermal circulation here. We start to see things like kaolinite, orthogenic kaolinite being developed in here, micro quartz. We see webby clays. We see pervasive calcite cementation in the system. There's a little bit of late stage leaching. This is uh, dissolution porosity in here and here, but it's nowhere near as pervasive as what we saw in the Yardner example. So there's only minor late stage leaching in the system. And there's a lot more evidence of pervasive hydrothermal alteration in these carbonates. Now, if we look at them isotopically, notice the scale now here. We're out at around minus four to minus 10 for the majority. These are mostly cuttings. Um, well, A4 is uh, core-based determinations. All the rest of those systems in there are cuttings-based determinations. But we can see there's a burial trend of increasing negativity in the oxygen isotopes and also somewhat slightly decreasing catagenic effects in the carbon isotopes. We can also see there's more negative carbon in what are more organic influenced lagoonal mudstones compared to the more uh, carbonate sand shoal platform systems. It's also interesting that in the system, some wells in the cuttings and also in the core actually sampled volcanics. And in those volcanics, there were calcite filled veins. And when you sample that vein calcite in the volcanic matrix, not in the carbonate matrix, but in the volcanic matrix, you can see the very negative oxygen related to the elevated temperatures associated with calcite hydrothermal veins forming that system. So this is a much more diagenetically evolved and degraded system in the Berman limestone. And when we put the two plots together, 
There's the Yardner Dolomite. There is the, the Yardner platform, the previous set of isotope data that I showed you. And here is the more evolved, deeper, attached platform vermin limestone system sampled in the cuttings from nine wells. And here is the hydrothermal system. So the isotope numbers here are clearly indicating ongoing diagenetic burial related evolution. So if we come back and compare the two types with a shelf edged um, attached platform in a deeper system where much of the primary porosity has been occluded in the second example we looked at versus the yard in the platform where it's shallower, there's preserved depositional porosity and there's been a leaching phase running through that preserved depositional porosity. And we still don't have a good handle on what's controlling this late stage burial corrosion. It certainly affected Yardner. It hasn't affected this system, or if it has affected this system, it's since been lost in the ongoing effects of ongoing burial diagenesis. And we'll just do a quick view of <coughs> some other Southeast Asian oligomycine isolated bedded platforms. This is uh, Malampaya in the Philippines, another giant gas field first flowed gas in September 2001 with commercial production in 2002. Um, it's now largely depleted. But if we look at Melampaya, which is basically gas with some oil and condensate, it has that same association of facies. These are milliolid rich lagoonal carbonates passing up as we go into the overlying deep water clastics. There is a drowning unconformity where we see globigerinid planktonics in the muds in here, whereas the lagoonal system here is much shallower, lagoonal for amol in this particular piece of core sample here. And we also see this very characteristic, once again, internal bedded nature to the platform, and then a drowning profile as the top nido here with a drowning unconformity on top of it. So Malampaya shows an evolution, which is basically a widespread isolated carbonate platform. Over time, that platform area retreats and then ultimately it's drowned. And so here is the last stage of the early Miocene, latest Oligocene drowning. And then structural complexity because it's sitting in a structurally complicated area. And then subsequent to that, we overlay the plastics over the top as a seal over the succession. So we see the same story of bedded platform ultimately retreating and becoming a drowned unconformity profile in Malampaya. If we go to the Madura Straits, this is a paper we published at AAPG back in the early 2000s and have a look in the oligomycin association in the Madura Straits. So we're not in the Neogene, I mean, we're, we're well into the, the oligomycin here, not in the uh, latest mycene. We'll be looking before at the internalite deposits, but these are um, carbonate bedded platforms. And this is Parong passing offshore in the KLC, KE11E and BD wells. This is now field in production. Um, none of the others are economic. But if we have a look there on those three systems, we can see in Parong the classic carbonate retreat profile with the drowning unconformity sitting in through here. This is the paper for reference in the APG if you're interested in going back to that paper. Where we see this type of once again the same story of a retreating platform that ultimately we start off with a bedded carbonate platform, retreating platform edges and ultimately forming a drowning unconformity at the top of the system. So we start off in unit time one with a widespread platform. That platform area retreats and retreats until it ultimately drowns, probably related to environmental degradation and the carbonate factory not able to keep up with the rate of sea level depth increase above and so ultimately the system drowns. What's interesting here also is that those four fields, Parong is not economic because of it's got poor seal integrity, poor seal configuration over the top. It leaks through a series of compactional drape faults over the top. 
plus it leaks through updip migration through here in the pliocene. Likewise, KE11C has uh, drape faults over the top, which allowed extensional faults allowing leakage. And KE11E has unfavorable uh, bed configurations allowing leakage. And the BD field, which was discovered back in 1987 or 89, has a much more favorable trap configuration and it's now in production. This doesn't just characterize the oligomyosine in Southeast Asia, this, this association, this Bennett association I'm talking about. This is the myosine of the, the Browse Basin from a paper by Van Til and others in 2018. And this is northwest shelf of Australia. And once again, we see that same retreating platform with a drowning unconformity over the top. We see the same thing in the Segatiga platform where the platform edge geometries vary from vertical accretion to even progradation to ultimate retreat and drowning, depending on the interaction between the rates of carbonate production and creation of accommodation space. And so Sigatiga had quite a complicated history. There's this paper by Bachtel and other shows. It starts off as two separate platforms, bedded carbonate platforms in isolation, which then merge and coalesce. Then we start to see backstepping and shrinkage with a drowning unconformity. And then later, the Muda formation covers the whole succession. So as well as the oligophotic association, all of these Southeast Asian platforms also have a drowning unconformity association. So they have this feature in common as well as the road algal for amol bedded nature and the lack of well-developed clear water coral reefs within the platform and mostly about the platform edge. And that is that during rapid sea level light rise, we see retrogradational margins, which progressively restrict the volume of carbonate production. And so carbonate factory retreat ultimately leads to a drowning unconformity. And we see that in all of the major fields in production or previously in production across Southeast Asia. That geometry is seismically resolvable. We, we documented this geometry back in this paper in 2002, but it still holds today. It is a drowning unconformity ge geometry that you can see in seismic versus a typical, which is sometimes called a type three sequence boundary versus a typical type one or type two sequence boundary that looks like this. So all of these systems have the same oligomyosine features in common. They are composed of bedded platform with interiors dominated by oligophotic alternating road algal and four amol lagoonal systems. The platform edges tend to show a combination of collapse margins and some patchy coralgal boundstone. Some of these fields show evidence of meteoric, because they are isolated platforms, show evidence of meteoric diagenesis related to episodes of subaerial exposure due to sea level lowering during platform accretion. Now that third point is a contentious point. There's still quite a bit of discussion of whether we're seeing meteoric diagenesis or we are seeing drowning episodes within vertically accreting carbonate platforms. But always we see a platform termination due to a drowning event, which ends carbonate deposition. And of course, the good thing about a drowning event is that it gives you three-way closure on the topographically highest portion of that carbonate buildup. Better reservoirs in the systems tend to be associated with drowned, isolated, bedded platforms with a capping hiatus of millions of years, allowing reservoir enhancing solutions to circulate prior to the clastic fill. They tend to be isolated rather than coupled platforms because coupled platforms are much more susceptible to sort of cyclastic degradation. On their updip side, they're connected to eogenetic meteoric cementation. And on their updip side, we see a lot of volcanoclastics being supplied to the system versus isolated platforms. Across the board, shallow burial depth 
shallower than 1500 meters is much better than deeper depths because it intends to minimize ongoing burial diagenesis. And there's also another factor, very obvious in Yardner and other fields as well, is this is the structural focus of aggressive catabaric fluids or cold marine circulation associated with the drowning unconformity prior to the clastic emplacement where we get cohoot circulation moving aggressive marine waters and leaching aragonite and other factors being leached in that carbonate. Okay, let's move on to the third example. I've got to do this in 10 minutes if I'm going to get the time. And that is where we look at fractured Permian carbonate plays in Thailand, but perhaps with some potential elsewhere as well. And this is where we see a structural focus to fractures. So if we think about the, the tectonic history of the Permian sequences in Thailand, we have a system which is a collision belt subject to later transpression. So during the Indocinian collision from the early middle Permian through to the late Triassic, early Jurassic, we had the Sibumasu continent, which is this zone out through here, moving into the, in toward the Indochina block. We have a subduction zone, which is the Sukhothai Island arc. And by the late Triassic, early Jurassic, we have a, the Sibumasu platform colliding with the Sukhothai arc. So that is the Indocinian collision sequence. So let's think about what's happening to fluids here. In the fluids here in the Sibumasu and the Indochina, both of which were carbonate terrains, we have typical passive margin burial. And that's the ongoing story of eogenetic to mesogenetic diagenesis in the, both the Indochina and the Sibumasu block. When we get into the collision phase, we see orogenetic thrust related fluids having the potential to overprint those mesogenetic normal burial systems. Then as we pass from the Indocinian 200 million years later, as India moves northwards, we set up a transpressional environment. We uplift this portion of Thailand. We reactivate old Permian structures as we collide India with Asia. And so we have the potential here to see varying levels of telogenetic fluids moving into the system. Here we see typical burial, early eogenetic, followed by orogenic, hot orogenic fluids. Here we see cooler uplift related fluids. So the tectonic history is controlling the nature of the diagenetic fluids that can alter the preserved diagenetic signature in these rocks. So here's some example of just typical passive margin textures. Here we can see Permian uh, fusilinid uh, coral, sorry, coralline algal or calcareous algal fusilinid matrix. Here we can see cavity fills with early marine cements, these layered systems here, followed by a late cavity filling cement. Here we can see these are typical uh, tropical marine carbonates. Here is the, the crinoid and here's an encruster growing around that crinoid with muddy matrix. Here we can see early marine cement linings. This, this light dark gray layering we see here corresponds with this layering we see in here. So this is a typical radiaxial uh, calcite replaced aragonite cement. And then we see later cavity filling calcite spar and even later vein filling calcite spar in this system. So this rock in a single outcrop has preserved eogenetic marine cements, mesogenetic cavity spar fill cements, and later cross-cutting fractures. If we look at it isotopically, we see that signature preserved. Here are the early eogenetic signatures, and here are the later spari signatures. Now, this specimen that I just showed you is located kilometers away from any sort of thrust deformation zone. So it's not seeing a lot of evidence of that orogenic event. It's seeing typical passive margin evolution. And so our, our burial temperatures are increasing as the cements get formed from hotter and hotter waters, poor waters, and we get down to values of, of minus 10, minus 11, minus 12. 
on that system. But then we can go into thrust affected areas. And so we can have areas where in the more thrust affected areas, we start to see much more pervasive later stage vein and thrust associated vein cements. So this is quarry two. This is less thrust influenced than in quarry three. In quarry three, here's a sub thrust. You can see it juxtaposing and deforming beds quite clearly here. And so we go from thrust or buried, but not intensely thrusted in quarry two into heavily thrusted cements in quarry three. In quarry C, you can, you can see these pervasive micro fractures. You can see uh, micro fractures in the matrix, number of episodes of micro fracturing in here. Uh, thick vein thrust cements. And we also see this is stained with alizarin and, and potassium ferrocyanide. Some of this late stage cement is quite furrowing, shown by the blue stain here. This is probably furrowin dolomite in this late stage spar vein in the system here. And when we look at the isotopes here, we can see quarry two. This is the early stages of burial, the passive margin just going into burial. This is the onset of late stage deformation. But when we get into the, the thrust vein cement, you can see that there's very negative oxygen values, much higher than minus 10 to a minus 11, minus 11 oxygen associated with hot late stage thrust vein cements. So the calcite spar in this system is preserving the early burial passing into later passive margin burial passing into thrust affected burial in this system. Then we can go to areas away from the thrust where we're looking at a uplifted area where there's a lot of evidence of quaternary car overprint. So we see the, uh, the Permian open platform with, with sort of burial spars in it as the typical fabric here. But then after that, we see these very late stage. Here is a cave. This cave is, is about four meters tall. And you can see the speleothems, the stalactites hanging off the roof in there. And you can see cast breccia in the floors of some of these caves. Um, you can see speleothem, typical radiaxial calcite uh, speleothems in here. This is all karstic speleothem cement running in here. So we can sample the uplift cements. We can sample the, the burial cements in this outcrop. And when we do that, we see the typical burial trend getting to values up around minus 10, but we're not seeing the thrust affected zone out here. We're stopping the cement signature at around minus nine, minus 10, but we're also seeing more negative carbon associated with soil waters associated with the meteoric fluids mixing as part of the uplift event associated with the Himalayan Paleocene event and subsequent uplift. We're seeing these meteoric cements in through here. So the clear things happening here is we're not seeing thrust related events. We are seeing meteoric cements in here and we are preserving the early burial passive margin cements in the Permian matrix. So what have we learned from the Permian outcrop? Well, we've established a burial curve. There's a consistent covariant carbon oxygen isotope signature due to ongoing fluid rock interaction under increasing burial and temperature. There is a matrix permeability shutdown indicated by oxygen 18 values around minus 10 to minus 11. And there is also in some areas, if we sample the speleothems and the fractures filled with later stage uplift cements, we can see a meteoric plot field in there. And we can also make the note that if we're going to talk about permeability creation in Permian carbonates based on what we see in central Thailand, then the most likely zone where we can create porosity and permeability is where we have reactivated faults and fault renewal driven by stresses created by a superimposed tertiary age event. Okay, and so as Mark Twain, that very famous American author said, before you go into the first subsurface, first you get your facts straight. Now you can distort, distort them as you please. So let's have a look at what we can do with our facts that we've generated 
from the outcrop in the Permian. So we're going to apply our outcrop isotope burial curve to a fractured berry hill. This is the Simpu Horn field in northeast Thailand. Now, Simpu Horn is a, is a relatively small field producing gas from a fractured uh, buried hill Permian Farnakau formation in the Saraburi group reservoir. The reservoir is variably fractured, dolomitized, and hydrothermally altered. Porosity in the matrix is quite low, but there are fractured zones where the permeabilities are quite high. And that's in effect what is the most important in creating reservoir is the intensity of fault damage, fracture damage, and reactivation in the system. And we would infer that much of that open fracturing is related to reactivation created by the Himalayan or the Paleocene Amen. So it's a classic buried hill association. And there's the Farnakau formation in there shown in the seismic, the ceiling beds atop it. In core, we see, <coughs> excuse me, in core, we see evidence of, of moldic porosity. Late stage porosity in the fact that we've got microfractures here which have been leached. And we can also see late stage stylitization leaching here. So this is all late stage leaching of microfractures and stylites. And we can also see that there are multiple fracturing events of different ages filled with sparry calcite in this core. So look at the, the, the plug values from some of the core. We can see that it's typically, I mean, remember with plugs, you're measuring matrix porosity and permeability. You cannot measure fracture porosity because you can't sample open fractures in a core plug. So this is matrix porosity and permeability, but we can see that dolomitization does in, increase porosity and perhaps slightly includes uh, permeability. But in those rocks where we've got microfracturing enhancement, we can see that they're getting up to quite high permeabilities in that system. So let's have a look at cuttings. And this is work that uh, a couple of PhD students did a few years ago, where they look at cuttings from Supu Hom field and they classified them up into different types of cuttings. So they divided up cutting samples from drill cuttings from a range of wells into calcites of different forms, dolomites, based on their color, and their, their reaction with uh, hydrochloric acid, 10% hydrochloric acid solutions, followed by XRD determinations to verify dolomite using the acid reaction as first pass indicators. Um, we can classify up into six basic groups of cuttings in this system. Also, you can do some interesting things in terms of um, photomicrographs of the, the cuttings. We made some thin section photomicrographs of the cuttings. And you can quite clearly see that there is evidence of multi-stage calcite vein fills in this system. Now you can't use a photomicrograph like this to say that this has got evidence of leaching porosity because it's sampled as a cutting. A lot of this fracturing and opening we're seeing here may be damage um, related to the, the cutting creation process. But there is some suggestion, you could say, of some dissolution here, but, but you couldn't say for 100% certainty because these are cuttings photomicrographs. They're not core or rotary sidewall core photomicrographs. You also see the contrast with the very tight macritic matrix. It's fairly tight, the matrix here in the system. Okay, the next slide is the isotopes that we ran. I've, I haven't bothered with putting all the different types of cuttings in here because you'll see in a minute, it's not much use. Um, what I've done is I've grouped everything just into three wells, sampling the, the, um, the Farnakau formation. And you can see the three wells are colored A, blue, well B, red, well C, purple. And what you can see in that for all cutting samples with more than 250 determinations is you can see that there is our old burial trend that we saw in the outcrop. But notice that this zone is away from the thrust belt. We are not seeing values getting much higher than minus nine, minus 10, minus 11. So our burial trend doesn't continue on out here into values of minus 14, minus 18, minus 20 that we saw in the thrust affected zone. So these sediments are probably not thrust affected. They are structurally not oprinted by fluids formed in a thrust zone. 
But what we do see is another trend. And that's the trend related to uplift. This is the, basically we're getting more negative carbons related to increasing levels of surface meteoric waters, perhaps deeply circulating to depths of a few thousand meters, but still more negative carbon values sitting in there. Perhaps they're catagenic waters as well. And we're also seeing cooler oxygen temperatures. The more negative oxygen values mean hotter temperatures, more positive oxygen values mean lower temperatures. So these waters were likely cooler than the burial waters, and they were likely more influenced by soil gas and or catagenic waters. By catagenic waters, I mean CO2 rich waters generated during source rock maturation. And what we discovered was if we just do something very simple, rather than classifying into six subgroups, which the poor students spent weeks doing on their projects, you can just basically teach a monkey to pick out calcite spar. And calcite spar captures both the burial curve and it captures the uplift curve. So spar calcite is preserving both of those trends quite clearly without worrying about doing detailed breakdown. So you can have a technician run this type of isotope on study on cuttings fairly cheaply once you've established a burial curve to compare things with. So what do we learn? Well, we've learned that cuttings can define diagenetic style when we've got something to compare them against, in this case, our regional isotope burial curve. And then we can use just, as I shown in the slide on the photomicrograph on the right, just use sparry calcite and we can see both of our burial and our uplift trends. And of course, we could supplement this because these are non-cored intervals by looking at image logs or oriented core samples. So what can we say in general? Well, putting everything we've had to say across all three examples, groups that we've looked at, the internal lights, the bed of oligomycin platforms, and the fractured burial plays, carbonate porosity is complex, and it's indicating ongoing reactions to various types of solutions. And a rock will continue to alter while there is some permeability to allow fluid cross flow into that rock. And that it's not just a simple loss of porosity with depth that we see in 99% of the sandstone reservoirs where we have nice compaction related porosity loss curves. Carbonate diagenesis is much more complicated. Certainly for most of the cases we like shallow reservoir. And we want reservoir at depths of less than 1500 meters to preserve better porosities and permeabilities. But we can also generate late stage porosity and permeability and corrosive porosity and permeability at greater depth. And there's not one size that fits all. We need good diagenetic understanding on a local basis. Isotopes help, but they don't solve. We're only as good as our understanding of the rock matrix that we're studying. You can only use isotopes in the context of geological understanding of the rock. If you just run isotopes without geological understanding, they'll tell you very little. So here are our three types, internal lights, oligophotic carbonate platforms with drowning unconformities capping them, and some of them subject to earlier episodes of meteoric leaching, and all of them showing evidence of in terms of economic porosity, later burial related leaching. And then the third type, buried hills, where we see an uplift associated signature in the isotopes. So let's broaden this a little bit. <coughs> let's ask ourselves a couple of questions to try and develop some new exploration paradigms in Southeast Asia. And the first one I'd like to ask is, did internal light waves impact on some oligomycin carbonate platforms? I mean, Internal light waves are not unusual in Southeast Asia. We've had all of these island arcs and things popping up and down across the tertiary. And so here's Palawan today and the Sulu Sea, and quite clearly you can see here evidence of internal light waves. Are there other suitable grainy mud dominated upper slopes facing into internal waves or solitons in Southeast Asia? Well, here's the Andaman Sea and maybe Yardner in some of its better 
sorted intervals wasn't a response to very shallow wave conditions. It might have been a response to soliton passage. And that's been suggested by Tillett as one of the possibilities for cleaning up some of those muddy oligophotic sands in the Miocene in the Ardenner field. So here's Andaman Island, here's the Andaman Sea, here's Peninsula Thailand over here. And you can see because of the restrictions as the gravity waves move through the island systems of the Andaman Islands here, we're generating internal waves. Probably also true in the Miocene when the isolated Yardana platform was active. And there's another possibility that we can wonder about. And that is, can we look at other areas in the region? For example, where we've got very tight matrix and we want to reactivate fractures in a very tight matrix to create economic levels of porosity and permeability. So a whole, are there a range of structural plays that we first got evidence of in our looking at the Permian of Thailand? But you know, is there a broader application, <coughs> excuse me, of that type of model? So let's consider the tightest rock we know in Southeast Asia. And this is the granite diorite basement in Bac Ho field in Vietnam. Now, does that opening of reopening of Cretaceous fractures and cantilevering and reopening of Cretaceous fractures, that model have some relevance in areas where not granite diorites of basement are present, but tight Permian or other age basement rocks are present. Because what happened in back hoe, and remember this is a super giant field. This is a billion, they produce more than a billion barrels of oil in this field. It's now in rapid decline, but they produced more than a billion barrels of oil from this field. The reason that they had such magnificent fracture production with ongoing fracture refill as part of that production was the fact that there is a thrust sheet and there is a thrust structure which cantilevered this upper granite diorite. This is a fresh granite diorite with fresh feldspars. You know, you look at the core on this rock and the feldspars wink back at you in the sunlight. You can see cleavage planes. There's no weathering of this rock. And that's the reservoir, but it's full of fractures. Some of these fractures have zeolites in them. Other are newly formed fractures. The fractures with zeolites probably formed back in the Cretaceous when there was an emplacement of this block, but there was a late tertiary thrusting in this rock. And that thrusting event juxtaposed this upper block of granite diorite over soft potential source rock muds. This block then collapsed and cantilevered and opened up the old Cretaceous fractures and opened up newly formed fractures in there as well. Now, that model could have relevance in appropriate thrust terrains, not just where we've got granite diorite basement, but other types of basement thrust as well. So here's our known carbonate tertiary age reservoir association systems, which I've now talked about, the three types, the internalite reworked upper slope, globigerinids being mudstones and waxstones being converted into reservoir rocks. And we know there are play fairways related to appropriate paleoceanographic positions. And also we want to see shallow burial and probably some early hydrocarbon emplacement in the system to preserve the porosity. Then we have a whole range of isolated, uh, non-attached platforms with oligophotic carbonate platforms with characteristic drowning unconformities that we can recognize seismically. And they are subject of different ages and styles of both early and later burial leaching. And we can map that in their isotope signatures as well. And then there are perhaps a whole range of buried hill plays with reactivated and newly formed fracture systems that can be created during later mesogenesis and telogenesis. And possibly not just in granite diorites, but also buried tight and brittle carbonate matrices that are fractured can be reactivated in this type of setting. And the question, can we do this with some types of volcanoclastics in appropriate thrust positions as well? So with that, I finish and I'll open it up with the question for discussion. Where do we go next? Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for your very interesting talk. It's very comprehensive. You discuss uh, from the Permian to very young sediments in Jobi Dobi Jarang Mundu. Uh, thank you very much. And now we're moving to uh, question and discussions.
Uh, we already have uh, four people want to have a questions. First, from Win Gaskowski. Uh, Pak Win, you can turn on your audio, please, and probably your video. Thank you. Oh, that's that's okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much for an, an excellent, uh, uh, comprehensive uh, uh, review and, and, and presentation. Uh, very thorough, Th sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I I can't talk uh, to anything of uh, your very complicated uh, uh, stories of, of diagenesis, uh, but what I would like to do is jump back uh, to, to to the beginning of of these complexes as they start to grow. Um, the the reason for this is I, I see there's a basic to me there's always been a basic dilemma uh, a, a carbonate uh, well captured in in sealing rock is a beautiful stretch trap uh, magnificent but that same sort of trap is all self enclosed and one has to wonder what is the migration path that is allowing hydrocarbons to come in at some point in time and get into this beautiful, perfect strat trap. I, I, I kind of take it back to the way most people draw their reefs. They always have the reef standing on some sort of a bump, some sort mm -hmm. of a platform. And a lot, quite often these platforms have little faults. They say, well, it's a horse. I would caution you as a geophysicist that uh, 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 a pull-up effect could be because of the carbonates and the bump may not be a bump at all. But what, what I'm, what I'm wor wondering about is what is starting a reef? Um, could, could it be that there was a fault system and it, 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 it finds a little bit of a, a high and that's where the proto-reef begins? Uh, maybe they're associated with this uh, fault system. There may be uh, oil seeps, which, and therefore it'd be nutrients that start the the proto reef. Uh, I, I, I'm 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 more. I'll let you, the experts, work about the diagenesis. I'm more wondering about how things got started and how do we have a migration path that gets into a beautiful, beautiful strat trap. Okay. Okay, let me answer two parts. The first thing, uh, I think that some of these systems are not sourced from below. They're sourced from the mature cap to the systems migrating laterally into the carbonates. Others are sourced from below. And I mean, once again, I just always remind myself, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And you've got to look individually at any carbonate basin and fairway and play and be ready to change your model based on what you observe in that basin. So I think there are certainly some systems that have fault from below feeds into the system. Others, I think maybe the seal is also a potential source in some of these systems. In terms of what starts a reef, when people have cored through a lot of reefs, what you tend to see is a relatively unbound sandy base and so typically there was some sort of bottom which was sandy and possibly stabilized and the other thing you need is light penetration so you need to have a system where you know to turn on your carbonate factory you can't do it totally in the dark you have to have some level it can be a ligophotic light or it can be euphotic light but you need some level of light penetration so quite often reefs instigate during times of lowered sea level where the platform is not completely subaerial, but there's sufficient lowering to allow you to form shallows. And then within that platform, there may be sufficient topography to generate that reef. And it's interesting that once the reefs generated in that early stage, because it tends to form a paleotopographic high, if you look at where subsequent reef positions are, and you can do this in the Great Barrier Reef, you can do it in Belize, you can do it in many, many reefs around the world, you find that the earlier Pleistocene highs are the foci for the later Holocene highs. So that the topography is inherited up through the stratigraphy a number of times. So, as I said, typically you need some sort of stabilized bottom and then 
subject to light penetration to allow that reef to form. Now, you can have organic rich marls around that structure. You can have earlier episodes that are maturing deeper in the basin and coming up along faults. You know, there's a whole range of moving hydrocarbons in to that system. And there's also another level of complexity which we have to think about, and that is, can you have aggressive basinal fluids coming out of your source rock kitchen and actually creating by leaching carbonate the pathway into the structure as well, where you have these aggressive catagenic fluids coming up into the structure as well. I mean, the first stage of catagenesis is CO2 production. And so CO2 in a pore water will make carbonic acid. And that's a nice way to leach some carbonate. You know, it's where all the, the later um, plays, the thermochemical sulfate reduction plays in the Northwest Territories of Canada, for example, are coming from are these catagenic fluids coming out of the basin quite aggressively in, into the basin system. And they tend to have a structural control up faults, but they're also leaching the fault as the fluids are moving up that fault. Sorry, that was a very long question. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, thank, thank, thank you very much. I uh, 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 appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, Bawin, for the questions, and thank you, John. The next is from Pa Herman. Hey, John, uh, thanks hey, for the talk. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, oligomycin, you talk about Permian. I want to ask a general comment from you about the eucin, eucin carbonate in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Okay, there, there is a, a general climatic optimum in the my, oligomycin where most of these things form. But I mean, if you set up the right climate, I don't know enough regionally to say if the Eocene is or is not suitable. I'd want to see some rock. And then I could talk about what type of rock we're looking at. But I mean, I, I see no reason why we couldn't have Eocene plays. There's no reason why we couldn't have Cretaceous plays given the right structural association. Um, you know, it depends on the nature of the diagenesis. And you, you, you just can't draw a simple single pen across the whole thing and say, you know, there's no burial diagenesis or there is pervasive burial diagenesis. It varies from area to area. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Pak Herman, thank you. Uh, the next one is from Pak Erlangga. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, John. Hi. Hi, uh, thanks for this very uh, brief and comprehensive lecture. So uh, quickly, I had to question. Yeah. Uh, both of it uh, relates to the eternal light wave. Mm -hmm. uh, first question is: uh, In case of a very strong wave agitation, uh, is it possible that the wave pushes back the deposits further back to the to the land? Like, is it closer to the land? Because in some case, I found an evidence that uh, uh, with a deposit. Uh, that is uh, pretty similar with the globigerinid uh, sand, mm -hmm. but it is surrounded by the uh, facies typically uh, to the subtidal or intertidal, uh, mm -hmm. which could be happen as the like uh, a tidal inlet deposits. Uh, yeah. The second question is, uh, uh, given the nature of the depositional setting that is adjacent to the slope, it is, seems it's look like a typical wave enhanced uh, sediment gravity flow. Uh, but uh, in this case, why we can't see any typical turbidite uh, sequence uh, instead of just uh, what you said, uh, cross bedded layers? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's my question. Thank okay, you. first part first. Okay, there's no reason why we could not get internal waves up on the shelf or the platform. It depends on the depth of the density contrast in the ocean. So the model, the analog I'm using, the depth you know, where it's generating now is at about 300 meters across that inter-island sill. But if you had a, a density stratification in the Miocene or the Eocene, which was shallower in the ocean, and you had a, a sill or a restriction at that level, you could generate internal light waves up on the platform. Um, typically, they wouldn't be in the intertidal. They would be further out on the platform than that because 
once you get up into the intertidal, you're starting to get into zones where you're seeing wave reworking and you don't get in that setting typically a lot of planktonics, a lot of globigerinids. I mean, the globigerinid oozes tend to dominate in somewhat deeper water. But I see no reason why you couldn't have a grainy lagoonal sediment if there was a density interface in that system with an internalite or soliton possibility there being reworked. I don't think I'd put it up in the intertidal. I'd want to keep it 30, 40 meters type water depths and greater. Okay, and now the second question, sorry, remind me the second question again, please. Yeah, uh, the, the second se question is um, why we cannot see any uh, turbidite sequence there? Okay, yeah, I remember that. Yep. Uh, okay, I think so it is pretty similar. The process is pretty similar with the like a wave enhanced uh, sediment gravity flow. So like uh, they bring back the, the, the deposits and uh, uh, just disperse it at the slopes, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. what the difference is, if you look at a, a, a cross bedded deposit, you require oscillating bottom currents and they've got to move to and fro. They might have to be exactly parallel, but they've got to move backwards and forwards over the system. With a the turbinite, they are set up by instabilities with a dense sediment laden body it might be kicked off by um, a seismic event or some other storm event they will move down flow and as they move down flow the energy dissipates typically as they come out of a channelized slope into the foot of slope fan and we dissipate the energy it starts to dump that sediment as it dumps that sediment you see the, the, the classic stacking of fabrics. We call it the Bauma cycle, but you go from upper flow regime to lower flow regime. You don't have oscillating directions of current. You have a, a unidirectional current, but it's weakening. And so sedimentologically, they are quite distinct. So if you've got globigerinid sands with cross bedding, I don't think it could be a turbidite. If you've got globigerinid sands, which have the classic lower flow regime, planar beds, passing up into massive, passing up into climbing ripple structures. And it's a globigerinid sand. I see no reason why a turbidite couldn't clean up a globigerinid ooze as well, but I'd expect a different set of sedimentary structures that would allow me to differentiate between the toing and froing of an internalite deposit, bottom reworking, versus the unidirectional current waning set of sedimentary structures you would see in a turbidite deposit. Okay. okay, okay. Mean that uh, it's only uh, it's only happening in the upper flow regime, right? Well, that's what turbidites typically do. It depends where you are. Yeah. If you're on the upper fan to mid fan transition, you'll see a transition from upper flow regime to lower flow regime. If you're out on the distal fan, you may only see lower flow regime sedimentary structures preserved. So. It depends on which position on the fan you are in terms of what side of turbidite grouping or coupling you'll get on those fan deposits. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Bayalanga, for the questions. Uh, next one we have uh, Paharui. Yeah, Paharui, you can. Hello. Yeah. Yep. Hello, I hear you. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear. Okay, sorry, because I'm just using my mobile. Okay, uh, John, thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentation. Even uh, I'm as a non-geologist, I'm a geophysicist, by the way, is uh, really enjoying and picking up uh, quite a lot of knowledge from uh, your presentation. And okay, I, I've been involved as a production seismologist uh, in a quite a number of uh, carbonate fields, including uh, tertiary carbonates in uh, Southeast Asia. So, but uh, I also uh, actually a certified and experienced diver, so I can understand quite a bit of uh, something uh, uh, underwater, especially related to the rifle built ups and uh, corals and so forth. So I have two questions. Uh, the first one is um, been involved in one, uh, one field in, um, in Malaysia and um, the upper 
uh, three units or three zones. So it's uh, like a layered zones and uh, edge of the field is of course um, a reef margin with an excellent reservoir. But um, uh, in the lagoonal area, there are three units. Uh, the bottom one is a really a very, a very good reservoir and uh, most of the production is coming from this interval. And above it, it is uh, very thin, but very tight. It is so tight so that um, any water coming from uh, the, uh, the reservoir below is never able to go up into the uppermost reservoir, another excellent reservoir in this case. So um, as a geophysicist that I was responsible to look or to interpret the 4D seismic, uh, we can see very clearly that there is no penetration whatsoever to this thin layer. This thin layer is so tight and, um, and the permeability is even very, very, very low. So that uh, there is no, no chance to, uh, for the water to come up into uh, the uppermost layer. Uh, um, and then uh, production coming from the uppermost layer is uh, never see any water but only depletion uh, in the pressure. So the question is, um, how can that uh, very short lift um, or very short deposition of this kind of things can happen and then uh, between a very good reservoir, it means that it might be shallow uh, to my understanding and then probably going into very deep and then in a very short while and then back to uh, the uh, shallow again. Is that mm -hmm. possible? So that's my yeah. first question. And then second question is, um, uh, I've seen a collapse zone in one part of a rifle build up. This collapse zone is almost circular and uh, can be seen that it is originated from the carbonate build up itself. So what could be um, the possible explanation of this collapse zone? Is that uh, something to do with scarcification and why is that possible? And, and why this, is, is that only in, in one part of the, um, of the carbonate build up itself? That's about okay. my questions. Okay, so it's very hard to give you a, a general answer without seeing some rock or some cuttings. So I'll, I'll predicate my answer with, this is speculation, okay? It's not reality because we haven't looked at the rock. But in a lot of these carbonate buildups, at least what I saw in Yarana, um, I think there is good evidence of drowning hard grounds forming in these systems and cementation associated with hard grounds. As I said, in Yardna, there is a big, there, there are two interpretation camps. One is that these are meteoric subaerial exposure surfaces. These hard grounds or this, this, this tight band that you're talking about. And the other is that it is a surface where the, the buildup was actually in effect drowned and then sea level shallowed again and a new episode of, of carbonate dominated deposition took off. Um, I'd ask a couple of questions of the geologist. The first one is, is that tight zone, does it have any coloration associated with it? Does it have a gamma kick associated with that tight zone? If it does, and you had some cuttings, you could probably differentiate, and some isotopes, you could differentiate between whether it's a hard ground or whether it's a subaerial exposure surface. And that would, you know, both of those possibilities are there. Typically with a subaerial exposure surface, you don't get a laterally continuous layer. And that leads into your second question. That collapse zone that you see in carbonates and you see it where you do have subaerial exposure, they are typically what we call collapsed dolomans. These are circular features they can range up to from meters across up to a few hundred meters across. And there's zones where during times of sea level lowering, we've lowered the water table by say 100 meters. We form caves and cast which connect up to the surface 
and that then collapses. And so these, these collapse zones that are formed in the meteoric cast realm tend to be either circular in shape or they follow joint patterns. But you typically don't see them acting as total barriers between an underlying porous permeable succession and an overlying porous and permeable succession. Whereas if you have a drowning profile in the middle of a, a carbonate platform accreting, it is a much more laterally continuous band. And so you can have much tighter lateral effects. So I guess I'm answering your question, as I said, this is speculation, but I would want to look at the rock and first pass, just look at some cuttings, some photomicrographs, some isotopes, and see if you could determine the nature of that dense band and look at it also in the gamma log quite often hard grounds because they are if you like sediment starvation surfaces they pick up a lot of uranium and so you'll see a gamma kick associated with that hard ground so there are some indications you could look at you know in, in your wireline and, and as well as your seismic to try and pick up the difference in terms of what is that tight band separating the lower and the upper zones in the reservoir okay okay yeah thank you very much okay thank you Baharui, for the question you can move to the next question from mas krishna yeah you can turn all your audio okay uh first of all uh thank you pak john for the very magnificent fantastic presentation i believe <laughs> it has fast forward <laughs> my carbonate sedimentology from 101 to 5.0. <laughs> Thanks. And Thanks, I have three questions. Uh, sorry, it's quite a lot, but I have three. And first is uh, I work in the central Kalimantan area where my carbonate field is near to the pushing uplift. Mm -hmm. And in the 3D seismic that we recently acquired, we have like uh alluding to your uh, mention of drowning conformity mm -hmm. uh, here we have one lapping apparently it seems like one lap of carbonates i'm uh, sorry plastic influx into the carbonates and one of the well was uh, penetrating uh, the area where uh, this on lap silt apparently goes into the carbonates uh, uh, envelope and it was a uh, poor reservoir so the question is uh, is uh, is there a, have you encountered this case where the plastic mix up with the carbonates and uh, somehow degrade the the uh, the final uh, properties uh, that's one and second is uh, also from the 3d seismic uh, we we can see the pinnacles uh, or mount small mounts in the in the uh, platform interior and what from the core i can see that there's a rubble of a uh, framework for us frame stone so the question is uh, how can we expect the frame stone framework porosity can still be uh, can still be uh, preserved and the third is uh, regarding the um, beer, the leaching, burial leaching. So uh, you mentioned about the aggressive uh, fluid coming from the basin into the carbonate platform that developed the 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 uh, burial leaching. But I have a, a quite different thought. Sorry, what if what about the uh, in situ water itself within the carbonates that was uh, eventually uh, become uh, catagenic and then acid and then create the dissolution. So the, the question is, uh, is it possible uh, if the uh, the meteoric water or the uh, seawater was contained during the uh, early diagenesis to the deep burial and then is it still uh, being inside the uh, formation without being expelled and then then uh, then makes up the mechanism for the uh, leaching 
uh, is it possible? Uh, thanks, Pat. Okay. Okay. I wrote your questions down, Chris, so I get them straight. Um, okay, I've got a question back to you. The, the clastics, you say they're mixed. Are they fine grain clastics and how are they mixed? Are they dispersed with the carbonate or are they in quite focused little positions within the carbonate? When you, when you uh, actually, it was um, sealed stone. It was sealed stone and then um, in one seismic layer, we can see that it was onlapping and then uh, we have a well there into the carbonates uh, and then uh, the, the, I mean, I mean the, the, maybe it's uh, a porosity and, and the gamma ray is also a little bit more shaly compared to the other wells and it was poor. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got a very thin, very thin shield. Yeah, you've got a number of possibilities. I mean, without seeing the, the rock and the, the log, I don't really know if I can answer it specifically, but I would, I would look for a number of things. I mean, you can get siltstones introduced to an carbonate via castification, where you get infiltration of silt, but that tends to be very focused. You don't see that in all of the matrix in the cuttings. If you've got dispersed siltstone, in the matrix, then you've probably got some sort of detrital input into the carbonate. Um, and you'd want to look at the associated biota in those zones to see if it's different to the carbonate that's the better quality carbonate, the purer carbonate. And is there a biotal change associated with the siltstone influx? In other words, was the environment degrading when the siltstone came in? So. I really can't answer specifically. And the, you know, the other thing I thought I had was, as I said, it's coming in with onlap, you're infiltrating through fractures already existing in the carbonate into zones, in the porous zones in the carbonate. But you'd see geopedal effects, you'd see gravitational effects if that was the case. If it's homogenous and mixed, then it's probably a degradation of the environment. I mean, is it a volcanoclastic or is it a, a carbonate mud? What is the nature of the clastic, the fine grain clastic that you're making the siltstone? That's something else to, to think about. Okay, so I, I don't know if I can answer your question, first question more than that without seeing some rock. Um, second question, so I have another question back at you. You said framework rubble. What did you mean when you said framework rubble? Is the, is the, is the boundstone rubbleized or is it rubbled in the core barrel because it's basically breaking up when you're sampling it? Um, actually, uh, uh, I saw a, uh, uh, some seismic uh, features, which uh, looks like mounded. However, we don't have mm -hmm. the actual well with the core into the, we have no well at all actually, but we have a well just beside the, uh, be, beside the pinnacle that have uh, maybe rework of, uh, rework of from the pinnacle and it looks like a um, frame stone. It's like a, like green coral or something with the yeah. big, I mean, uh, primary are, you talking to, are you talking to Krishna Thanos about this? I mean, Krishna's work had the same sort of thing in those four wells that she studied for his thesis and her thesis a number of years ago, but she had a rubbleized frame stone, but it was basically slope debris. And when we looked at it diagenetically with the isotopes, it was nowhere near as cemented up. I mean, the stuff up on the platform that was bound stone was full of marine cements and it was you know totally cemented up and tight but the stuff a little bit further down which was this rubbleized still you know frame stone but it had tumbled down into deeper water it had a more evolved diagenetic history because it didn't cement up in the shallow waters of the platform and she was yeah. seeing evidence of ongoing diagenesis but still enough to preserve preserve some porosity and permeability in the well so i'd go back and have a look at the core in that well that you've got to look at and see if you can generate a model and get yeah, Krishna, yeah. we work in the same company, aren't you? Get her looking over your shoulder and talking about what she did for her thesis work because it sounded quite similar to what she did in some of her thesis study and that work she did in Kalimantan. Okay. Okay, third question. Burial. Oh no, is Krishna out there in our audience today or not? Didn't she make it? Anyhow, third question. Leaching burial. Um, in situ catagenesis. It's difficult. 
because what tends to happen is that when you bury the pore fluids and you, you they remain in situ, the rock tends to undergo rock fluid interaction and reach equilibrium. You need typically to have some sort of disturbing mechanism to disturb the chemistry from what's normal in that burial, buried, you know, conate basin or water to make it aggressive. So, you know, as I said, typically it's introduced from outside. It's very, I find it hard to visualize a mechanism where pore fluids in continuous contact throughout the burial history with the rock matrix haven't equilibrated with that rock matrix. And so I, I can't see a way of making it aggressive unless I can introduce something hotter, more CO2 rich or some other fact that it'll let those aggressive waters get in there and leach. But in situ, without introducing some chemistry from outside, I find that personally, I'll say it can't be done, but I find it hard to visualize a mechanism for that to happen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Pai John. Very good so much, Chris. Give me a call if you want to talk about it some more after we, you know, next week sometime. Give me a call and we can chat some more. I'll, I'll give you some li literature on it if you want. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Pai John. Okay. Thank you, Patrisna, for the questions. Thank you, Barry. Uh, next one we have uh, Mas Yudis. Yeah, you can turn on your audio, please. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Pak Ricky Tampo. Uh, well, hello, John. Hi. Yeah, my name is Yudis. Uh, it's nice to meet. It's nice to meet you in Wemidar. It's very nice to watch your magnificent presentation this afternoon. Honestly, uh, and my question is just maybe the basic one about the platform evolution in your slide. Okay. Uh, the first, according to you. Is there any difference about the morphology of cars that forms in catch up phase and keep up and keep up phase? And the second one, uh, the implication for porosity after that, is there also any big difference about the porosity that forms by platform in catch up phase and platform in keep up phase after the sea level drop or in fado zone? Yes, that's it. That's it. Okay. Okay, so it depends on the, the platform, if I understand your question, it will be dependent on the platform geometry. Um, you know, platform growth rates across a platform are not necessarily equal in all positions on the platform. In a, in a classic coralgal rimmed reef, you will see higher topography around the platform rim and not in lower in the platform center. So let's say you've got 10 meters of sea level drop and the lagoon is 20 meters deep. You won't expose a lot of the platform interior, but you will expose the topographically high platform rim and some of the platform. If on the other hand, you've got a catch up phase, which is infilled the accommodation space all the way across the platform, which is more typical of a ligotrophic or sorry, oligophotic um, bedded carbonates, then you'll see cast developed all the way with a slight fall in sea level, you won't expose it. But if you've got a fall of 20, 30 meters, you'll expose the whole bedded platform. Oligophotic platforms don't have the elevation internally that we see in the photozoan coralgal margin platforms. But it's also dependent on what are your higher order sea level fluctuations in terms of magnitude? Are they 10 meters? Are they five meters? Are the frequencies a million years or a hundred thousand years? All of those factors are gonna to have to be brought into play to make that interpretation or understanding. Yeah. So I, I don't wanna give a generalized answer, <laughs> okay? I wanna know more about the paleo topography and the nature of the, the biota that's creating that sediment before we could talk more about whether you think it's a pervasive single surface or a topographically high exposure without other parts of the platform being exposed okay uh, yeah the second one uh the implication of porosity after that uh, maybe you can explain about this okay uh, yeah. okay so in terms of porosity associated with cast it depends on how much fluid movement you have through the system. Some people have looked at 
at porosity and permeability in modern cast systems and made the statement that there's no real change in porosity and permeability in terms of the total reservoir volume. Other people have said, no, it depends on how much cross flow of water can escape that system. So if you've got large volumes of water moving through the system and escaping and not forming cements, then you can get pervasive porosity enhancement. It's also dependent on the mineralogy. If you've got aragonite versus magnesium calcite. If you're at a time or a, a depositional system where you have a lot of aragonite bioclasts, that's much more susceptible to moldic leaching than if you've got a bunch of forams or coralline algae, which tend to be more magnesium calcite rather than aragonite, and they're less susceptible to pervasive karstic leaching. So it depends on the rock. Once again, look at the rock, then you can make some generalizations once you understand the rock type that you're looking at. Okay, wonderful answer. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you what's your this next question from Pak Win. This is the, going to be the last question, yeah. Pak Win, okay. you can turn audio, please. Oh my goodness! Thank you very much. I, I didn't anticipate to be the last question. This 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 is a something you just said uh, 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 spurred a thought. Uh, I am also a, a diver, and you go out to the Thousand Islands, and you see you, you see their linear trend. But you, you're also you also have to be impressed by the fact that uh, when the tides come in and tides go out, that each of these patches are experiencing uh, almost like a breathing effect uh, because of the tides. Uh, so yeah, the, the, as you just said, the, where you are and the, 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 the shape of the platform, and I would think the possibility of tidal effects would be moving your fluids. Uh, is, is there then a difference when you have something that's up against the volcano uh, that would not have uh, those sorts of tidal effects, and, uh, uh, and and then the the diagenesis is completely different because the fluids are not moving. Okay, um, okay. So tidal pumping, moving fluids by tidal action. What we <coughs> excuse me. What we tend to see is marine cements, and there's a whole range of documented examples of marine cements. Um, forming in reefs. I mean, if you look at a typical reef, you know, it starts off with porosity of, of 60%, you know, with all the overlapping of the corals and the coralline algae and the bioclastic sediment moving in, you still get porosity in those cavities in a reef of about 60%. But because of the action of seawater pumping, driven largely by tides, but also by waves and currents, you tend to see that porosity disappearing very quickly in yeah. the reefal system and so you know there's, there's very few reservoirs anywhere in the world where the coralgal reef itself is the reservoir unless it's been diagenetically altered i mean you go to the permian basin in west texas for example and i think there's one well in the capitan formation everything else is in the back reef and a little bit less but it's quite a bit in the fall reef in that system so the reef itself tends to cement up pretty early on um, yeah. In terms of the volcanoclastics and the volcanics, you've got much more labile reactive clays in there, zeolites. I mean, we've, we've looked at, in the Philippines, we looked at a contact with a bunch of carbonates and um, the volcanics in a number of areas. And in the volcanics, you could be seeing, where it's fascicular volcanics, you can be seeing porosities of 60% and permeabilities of less than 0.1 of a millidarcy because there's just no yeah. connection between the vesicles and in the alteration zones around those volcanics where you get a, a hydrothermal halo if it's got a lot of volcanoclastic silt in it you tend to tighten things up so you lose the porosity and permeability there as well um, mm. where you tend to retain it is where you have high energy shorelines so if you've got you know, wave action on the shoreline, you, you can clean things up and get rid of the clay. But what you don't want in the volcanic situation is a lot of clay being preserved in that sediment. Because if you have that, you very quickly lose the potential. You can keep high porosity because you've got a whole bunch of pumice and other things in there, but you'll quickly lose the potential for fluid flow and permeability. So once again, it's hard to generalize. It depends where you are. But one generalization I would make is that reefs, start off with very high depositional porosity. 
by the time you get them back into the subsurface and they pass through the marine eogenetic, the reef itself, because it gets so much tidal pumping through it, you tend not to see a lot of porosity preserved in the reef itself. You tend to see it more in the, the grainstone and the rudstone belts on the reef flat or in the fore reef. You tend to see depositional porosity preserved. Yeah. Mm. It's a general rule that most people use when you're drilling the depositional porosity in a carbonate. You don't drill the reef crest. You step back into the lagoon about half a kilometre or you step forward into the basin about half a kilometre and expect to see depositional porosity there, not in the reef itself. Thank, thank you, sir. Okay, John. Uh, okay, uh, this is the question from uh, from the previous uh, question. Uh, the problem is, uh, the question is, uh, how is the prospectivity of talus as a reservoir in hydrocarbon? That's the question. Sorry, uh, prospectivity of what? I didn't catch the of, of talus, of... talus reservoir. Talus, sir. Talus, uh, reef talus, quite high if it's got the right history. Um, you know, there, there there are a number of wells around the world where reef talus has been produced. I mean, it depends how deep the talus is, but quite often talus, reef talus, is deposited in water depths that are more than 100, 150 metres deep on the front side of the reef. It depends on the reef topography. But reef talus in that situation can preserve porosity and permeability because it doesn't see a lot of eogenetic cementation. It gets below that zone, and so it tends to maintain porosity and permeability. Um, until a later episode of development. So, you know, given the right diagenetic setting, reef talus is, is quite prospective. Okay, okay, thank you. I hope that will answer the question. Okay, John, that's the end of the question session. Thank you very much for your excellent you. presentation and discussion. We are very honored uh, to have you. And uh, thank you for sparing your time during your weekend at our POC platform. Well, no problem. These days with COVID-19, I don't have weekends. It's one big continuous weekend. No work occasionally. Yeah. So, uh, no, no, that's good. Thank you very much. And uh, later you said that you will upload this material in your website, right? Um, yeah, but, but put this up that you've recorded because I'm going to do it over the next month. I mean, I'm going to break it out into three separate topics on the website as training videos. And so I'll put it, it'll be a different, slightly different content to what you're going to put up as the talk. Yeah, okay, so thank I think you. We should get access so, to both. Uh, as, I, okay. as I mentioned before, I, I will put this uh, recorded video to the YouTube so everyone who cannot attend this live meeting, we can uh, enjoy the, uh, the YouTube video. So that's for and me. For those of you that are left, uh, if people want to contact me and discuss more, if people yeah. want to contact me and discuss more, that's fine. They can, they can Skype me or email me and we can discuss things some more as well. It's no, no problem. Yeah, thank you very much, John. And can we uh, turn on our videos and say, uh, can I say something to John? Yeah, this is the time to, to say uh, something to John if you want. Yeah. Can you all? Can Thank you, you very all, much, John. All video? So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. How are you? Thank you, John. <laughs> See you all. Yeah. Your <laughs> faces are appearing on my screen. Yeah. And thank you to <laughs> organizer as well. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you, Pa John. And okay, thanks. Thanks. Very Take care. Okay. Okay. Thank you guys. Okay, we'll That's talk to you soon. In these days of COVID, when it's over, we'll see each other again, hopefully. Bye. Melinda? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, John. So we come to the end. Uh, stay safe uh, wherever you are. And hopefully next time, if you come to Jakarta, please let us know. We are very happy to have a meeting and session for, for C with you again. Yeah, no problem. And see you again and have a great